Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesus. I'm proud to call you my son. And your ears <laughs> are exactly what God had in mind when <laughs> God made you. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Tom Volso, the great Tom Volso. And thank you for all of uh, all of you for being here uh, tonight. Uh, I'm deeply grateful to Thomas and Romel for allowing yourselves to be honored. It has been the privilege of my life for 30 years to have my heart shaped and reshaped and my life altered uh, by those whom some might call bad hombres. and Mujeres, if I can, I want to keep the pronunciation bad. Uh, in these three decades, I've been taught so much, uh, and above all, the homies have, have really kept me humble. Uh, I got a text just a couple weeks ago from a homie I didn't know just out of prison, and I guess he got my number from one of the 120,000 gang members in LA County who have it. <laughs> And it was very solicitous and kind and kind of formal, talking about how he got out of prison and how much time he had done and hoped against hope that maybe he'd get hired at Homeboy. And he began the, the text kind of formally with Father Greg. At least I think he was trying to write Father Greg. Autocorrect helped him. And it, it said, Fat Boy Greg. So, at least I think he was trying to say Father Greg. <laughs> the great Miguel, Miguel Lugo uh, sent me a text. Uh, I was uh, on, been on the road and he was lamenting the fact that I was probably gone too much. And he said, we need you back here. Uh, you know, and he said a slew of very nice things. And he ended this message uh, by saying, you are the Gumby of this organization. So I stared at that for a long time and marinated on what the Gumby of this organization meant when he sent an additional text that said, I meant Gandhi. <laughs> I said, why, thank you, Pokey. <laughs> I, I got a letter a month ago from a homie I've known for 30 years named Lefty, and uh, he was in prison and uh, kind of a long stretch, and he um, met this nun a chaplain or a volunteer, and she was explaining to Lefty how the church makes saints. And right in the middle of the letter, he gets kind of wistful, and he says, damn, gee, I wish I was Pope, because I would canonize you right away <laughs> with the biggest cannon I could find. Yeah, we'd shoot your ass from the homeboy parking lot right out of that cannon. We'd charge tickets and make a grip of money. So don't be surprised if that replaces this event next year. Your presence here tonight uh, places you at the forefront of this revolution of tenderness which is Homeboy Industries, as many have expressed tonight. It is a sacred place where we love each other into our own awakened hearts. This revolution of tenderness helps us move from being separate and superior to connected and compassionate. We find, in fact, our fundamental identity in each other, in kinship, and say to the other, as the Buddhists put it, O oh, nobly born, do not forget who you are. As one of our trainees, Samuel, puts it, homeboy holds us accountable to the invitation. The invitation is to place one's fears in the cradle of loving kindness. 
only found in community, really. You have to heal before you can have hope. A homie told me the other day, it's getting harder and harder to facade my way through the day. As an English major, I wasn't aware you could use facade in quite that way. But we all know what he means. It takes time for folks who don't as yet own themselves, having been hijacked by their own trauma. Things have happened to them that have darkened their lives forever. Until, that is, they find relief, a sanctuary, a safe haven where healing can happen. Homies come to us thirsty and in flames, both requiring water. A Danny, a trainee, uh, said to me, you know what I love most about Homeboy? You're not embarrassed by us. Your presence here tonight, unembarrassed as it is, celebrates men and women who have located an open-hearted, spacious love in their thoroughly good and unadorned selves, freed of posing, posturing, and mask. Not a bad hombre in sight. There's a homie named David who worked for us uh, for a time and uh, kind of by his own admission, he would have called himself a knucklehead in and out of being locked up and never did well in school. And, and I knew him locked up and I knew him on the outs and, and he was a yo-yo back and forth. He was a complicated guy. David is a mansion. He's got lots of rooms. And then he came to Homeboy and things started to change and he decided to change. And, and uh, for someone who had such a bad experience in school, he graduated from high school and then went to uh, East LA College and was doing really well. In fact, he came home one night uh, to uh, where he lived with his aunt and he said, Tia, I made the dean's list. And she goes, oh, David, even in college you get in trouble. The old assumptions and categories are hard to shake. What makes a person resilient in the end is to learn to own yourself, and David has now pulled that off. At Homeboy, folks are, as the poet says, won by warmth, ripened affectionately. Recently, I got a text uh, from a trainee, and he writes, I've, just, I've decided to live in love's energy. Now I come to work and my heart smiles. I walk in the door and there it is, the aroma of kinship. The fundamental ethos of Homeboy Industries is walking with, not doing for. All of us stare at our own shared ruin, and then we walk away together as kin. What James Baldwin called us achieving ourselves. All of us finding our true selves in a community of tenderness, all of us essential allies to each other, declaring boldly to the other it is the privilege of a lifetime for you to be who you are. O oh, nobly born. Now, let me end with this story. Years ago in our, our first office after Dolores Mission, 1848 East First Street, like 25 years ago, uh, 
Yes, an address. Just got an, an applause there. Um, but in those days, you know, we used to have a lot of kids who would come uh, from Hollenbeck School or Second Street School on their way home to the projects, to Elisa Village or Pico Gardens. And they'd all come in and, and the staff there would lavish so much cariño and affection on them that it, it was like a, a dry sponge getting water. And the thing they loved the most was going on errands. You know, it didn't matter where, Smart and Final, Food for Less, Office Depot, the post office. They wanted to go with any staff member who was going somewhere and, and on taking a, an errand. And there was a 12-year-old Betito, and he came into my office one day after school, looked very sad, and he said, hey, G, are you going anywhere? I said, no, Michael. Can I go with you? <laughs> it was uh, not the destination so much as the going with. Uh, he was, uh, English was not his uh, f a strong suit, you know, though I speak Spanish. He refused to speak Spanish with me. It was always English. And then he sort of loved, you know, picking up expressions, e English expressions from, you know, commercials and TV. One day he came in, I think he had learned this from like a Pollo Loco commercial, and, and he said, hey, G, you know what you are? You're the real deal. <laughs> At $1.99. And then it became the answer to every question. I say, well, Beto, you know what, why your teacher said that to you. He goes, no, why? Because you're the real deal. And we went back and forth, and then pretty soon it became our nickname for each other. You know, oye, real deal, ven pa' acá. How come you can talk like that with her? No, 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 real deal, real deal. Once he came into my office and he said, hey, gee, kick me down with 20 bones, yeah? I said, what do you need $20 for? Taking my lady to the movies. I said, well, how old are you? 12. I go, 12? How old is your lady? 16. I said, 16? He goes, yeah, but she's short. <laughs> Here's $20. <laughs> Knock yourself out. So one Sunday night, uh, I remember there wasn't school the next day. It was around 9, and it was kind of a warm evening. And uh, Beto was playing with his cousins in Aliso Village housing projects. And there were two gang members standing in front of a dumpster smoking cigarettes. And a van came in uh, with two gang members with heavy weapons. And they see the two gang members and they begin to open fire. Well, every man, woman, and child in the projects knows what to do. You duck behind a car, you lay down behind a low wall, you move. But Beto didn't move and because he hesitated for even a second, suddenly a very large bullet entered his side and traveled through his body and, and left, what we used to call a through and through. The doctor who uh, attended to him told me later that it was the largest caliber bullet he had ever seen. Just the sheer force of this traveling through his body, the sheer reverberation of it had rendered him paralyzed from the waist down, though it had never even touched his spine. So word got to me, and I went to the hospital, and I sat there with Betito's grandmother, and we kept vigil. Though truth be told, vigil sort of keeps you in six hours, they operated on Betito, and he survived. But an hour into the time that he was in the intensive care unit, I could see through the glass as a team of doctors and nurses ran in there and pounded on his chest and begged and pleaded with his heart to cooperate. And, and it just wouldn't. And he died. Now, 
Betito was precocious and smart, and he was 12 years old, and he was the real deal. But two days later, I knew who the two guys were in the van, and it was excruciating for me to be unable to hate them because I knew them. And you can't demonize people you know. Humans can't pull it off. And I knew their stories, and I knew the terror, and I knew the torture that had darkened their lives. I knew all that had happened to them. And I knew that they also were the real deal but they just hadn't found their way to a safe haven where healing happens how then can we together be accountable to the invitation us achieving ourselves standing against forgetting that we belong to each other. And there are no exceptions to that. How can we move from being separate and superior to connected and compassionate? Each one of us, the real deal. And so we choose, all of us together, to look into each other's eyes and hold out always for the truth. O oh, nobly born, do not forget who you are. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.